When preparing for the video on hair metal, I wanted to get a glimpse of what life was like in the 80s, and Audible made that possible with a download of The Dirt, read by the members of Motley Crue telling their own story. I can't stress enough that if you've only seen the reenacted movie version of The Dirt on Netflix, you need to hear The Dirt from the voices of Motley Crue themselves and hear everything the movie left out. Visit audible.com slash get rocked or text get rocked to 500 500 to try Audible free for a month and get a free title download. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anywhere, anytime, when traveling, working out, walking, doing chores, anything. Completely risk-free to try for 30 days, and even if you cancel, you can still keep that free audiobook download. Link is in the video description, and let me know in the comments if you downloaded The Dirt, because, wow, the 80s were wild. Hair metal, glam rock, whatever you want to call it. In the 1980s, it dominated rock and proved that the sleazier you were, the more successful you became. Hair metal and glam have not been looked kindly at in retrospect, including from me. And to be honest, that's not truly fair. There were great albums in this depraved, degenerate age of the 80s, and this video looks at 10 great hair metal albums. I'm fully aware that I was not alive for most of this era, but that doesn't mean I can't appreciate the bands and albums that came before my time. Rules for the list. This is not a top 10, no ranking, just a list. And one entry per band to add variety. I'm considering anything glam rock to hair metal fair game, and I'm only going to be looking at albums released in the 80s as to help narrow things down a bit. There would be way more to cover if I didn't, and the 80s were when this sound was the big thing, so I feel it appropriate to focus on that decade. You know how these videos work, let's get to it. The true breakout album from the crew and the album that made the group infamous. Shout of the Devil from 1983 went several times platinum, sold over 200,000 copies in its first week, with minimal advertising or support from the label. This was a glimpse of how much Motley Crue's reputation would carry the band, as well as Crue's loudest and most defiant album at a time for the rock and roll lifestyle. Shout of the Devil had wildly mixed reviews upon release, from sleazy and notorious metal at its best to punk rock lobotomy metal. In the 80s, every heavy music fan had an opinion on Motley Crue, and after Shout of the Devil, for good reason, because they exploded here. The title track was the perfect anthem for Motley Crue, and was almost even more sacrilegious as the early version was Shout with the Devil. Big songs including Looks to Kill and a cover of the Beatles' Helter Skelter was a statement that the band was going to do whatever they wanted, and the most important thing in this group was attitude. It worked. Shout of the Devil is one of the many perfect snapshots of the 80s. It reflects so much of the culture of that time and the fact that it was Motley Crue pushing themselves out there in the sleazy LA rock world and coming out as stars, proving just how much momentum the group had. The debauchery paid off, well, maybe not physically. I think the group is still dealing with the hangovers. Oh, yeah. The world of heavy music owes a special debt to Dee Snider and Twisted Sister for just what they stood for through righteousness and defiance. And Stay Hungry was the base that everyone took notice from. In 1984, Twisted Sister released the most successful album ever, along with the two biggest songs the group's done. This was the breakout for Twisted Sister, and if you didn't like them, Dee Snider didn't care. While so many hair metal and glam rock bangs were about the party and having a good time, Twisted Sister were about counterculture and riling everyone up. The music videos are iconic. The look of Twisted Sister was the model of what that 80s style encapsulated, and Dee Snider became the voice of a rebellious generation. We're not gonna take it, and I Wanna Rock are timeless. In many ways, I feel Twisted Sister are the lesser talked about big names in glam that should get more recognition from this time period for what they accomplished, and Stay Hungry is by far the album to showcase what the group had. Stay Hungry is the ultimate pump up album. I want to add that Twisted Sister was such a part of pop culture that they made one of the best film cameos of all time by performing Burn in Hell, the climax of Pee Wee's Big Adventure in 1980. It was perfect. In a way, Tim Burton owes his career to Twisted Sister. Or that's how I see it. Every rose has its From the Sunset Strip to Brawling on Tour to worldwide fame to women pledging their lives to Bret Michaels, Poison embodied everything about glam in the 80s. Open up and say... Ah, was Poison's best-selling album of going several times platinum and having a number one song with Every Rose Has Its Thorn, which is still played at rundown bars by divorced dads on touch tune stations to this day. Joke all you want, but no band in the 80s got more attention from the ladies than Poison, which is saying a lot. And it mostly has to do with one Brett Michaels who swooned millions of hearts over the decades. Still is. I saw Poison live as a photographer and I thought ladies in the front row were going to try to kill me just to get to him on stage. DeVille's guitar work was the creative flair that made Poison's music stand out a bit and open up and say, 
Ah, was music for strippers, and I say that because Bret Michaels specifically wrote some of these songs about strippers. Every Rose Has Its Thorn is a staple of poison and the perfect 80s cheese, while Nothing But A Good Time and Fallen Angel were also songs that people loved. The album was later in the 80s, making sure that while other groups were strung out or fighting to keep going, Poison was able to stand tall while millions of ladies threw their underwear on stage. And probably men. Let's be real, Bret Michaels has that effect on people. Cinderella was another of the groups who may not have made it to Motley Crue levels of fame, but definitely made their impact felt on the first two albums. While Night Songs was the smash debut and true glam album, almost to a fault, Long Cold Winter in 1988 was Cinderella's attempt to extend a bit further musically and give more than the cliche glam. It worked as this was Cinderella's best-selling album. From Critty Philadelphia came one of the most belted out broken heart songs of all time in Don't Know What You Got Till It's Gone. This made Cinderella world famous and Long Cold Winter proved ballads and drawn out solos were still as strong as ever when the 80s closed. The singles from the album were released for over a year after Long Cold Winter came out. That's saying something considering the competition at the time. Even if this album feels uneven in performance and tone, the standout moments are so well done that Tom and company proved themselves as more than one hit wonders. Long Cold Winter was Cinderella's peak and where Cinderella started venturing into blues rock territory, which was an ambitious shift that the group would stick with for years, Cinderella has hung it up a few years now and it just reminds us even more that we don't know what we have, in this case Cinderella, until it's gone. The story of Dokken is one worth remembering, as this was a band who had to keep convincing their label Elektra that they had something just to convince them to release albums under their contract. When Under Lock and Key finally was given a chance and the sales started coming in along with chart success, the suits at Elektra realized that this was a group worth pushing from the beginning. Dokken proved themselves. Don Dokken and George Lynch already had admiration from their peers, but it was a slow success story. Under Lock and Key was a breaking point for the band to see massive success, so much so that the previous album Tooth and Nail would start selling more more due to Under Lock and Key's success. George Lynch is untouchable in some of this album, and I feel Under Lock and Key is Dawkins' most complete album. Songs like In My Dreams and It's Not Love were concert staples through the 80s, and helped prove a heavier hair metal and glam style like Dawkins could have some diversity. It's great to hear Under Lock and Key with a different side of guitar and vocal bombast and ballads and solos than the poppier style that made the mainstream drool. The only thing that would have made this album perfect is if Dream Warriors from the Nightmare on Elm Street sound track was here. That song defines what 80s schmaltz should be. Whitesnake's self-titled album from 1987 has a legacy all its own and is the crowning jewel of what David Coverdale has done, proving that hair metal and glam were a part of England. This self-title was one of the few releases where Coverdale collaborated with another musician in writing, and it paid off as the album went eight times platinum in the United States, with certifications in seven other countries as well. You want the hair and huge choruses? You got it. You want the guitars and solos and ballads? You got it. You want something a bit more mature and bluesy? You got Whitesnake. This album was another that reveled in the grit and dirt of the 80s, with Coverdale saying his goal of the self-title was to make it leaner, meaner, and more electrified. This album was a phenomenon throughout the world and treated as such, with North American and European album versions having different track lists, Europe getting more songs. That did not stop North America from losing it over This This Love and Here I Go Again 87. White Stick reveled in power ballads, and this album had some of the best out of that decade. While many hair metal albums had mixed reviews and receptions for the public, this was an album that was beloved by many and cherished across the continents. David Coverdale may be the only constant in White Snake, but this White Snake album still holds strong. This is where some of the arguments in the comment section are gonna start. Is Bon Jovi hair metal and glam rock? Is Bon Jovi good? I don't know what it is about Bon Jovi that forces such strong opinions for everyone, but in 1986, Slippery When Wet was massive. This was the album you could not escape from and that everyone heard on the airwaves. If the 80s needed more sleaze and rock, Bon Jovi and Jersey had plenty to offer. Slippery When Wet was a turning point that took hair metal and made it mainstream friendly. It wasn't so much about the partying and lifestyle as it was about singing along and making everything up beat. People can say they've never heard Slippery When Wet, but those same people know the words to living on a prayer and you gave love a bad name. When the chorus of Wanted Dead or Alive hits, you hear random people start singing along indistinctively without even realizing it. 
these songs are still in pop culture and media today. With TikTok and YouTube shorts, I'm sure that's not gonna stop either. This is Bon Jovi's greatest achievement, and even with their comeback at the turn of the century, Slippery When Wet is the Bon Jovi album and a pivotal part of the 80s in music. Like Bon Jovi or not, this album had made rock more accessible to the public. There's something to be said for that. And don't act like you've never belted out living on a prayer before. You know you have. I put a poll on the YouTube community page asking for either Hysteria or Pyromania. Hysteria won. In 1987, Def Leppard triumphed after many bands and musicians would have understandably called it a day. The group returning after several years of question made sure Hysteria was possibly the most anticipated album in the 80s, along with being Def Leppard's best selling. Hysteria spawned seven singles and was over an hour of music that showed they could move on. This is a triumph mostly for Rick Allen, who returned to play drums with one arm, while the rest of the group was played with delays and dealing with the aftermath of the accidents. I know people will argue which is Def Leppard's best album, but I feel Hysteria is the most iconic and representative of what the band's done with that slight transition in what people call pop metal. Animal and Love Bites are instantly associated with the band and the 80s, while Pour Some Sugar On Me became one of the best concert anthems ever for the group. Still is. <laughs> It's 80s hair metal to stadium rock and a band becoming legends with the term hysteria having a new meaning. This was as much inspiration as it was a big moment in rock in the 80s. And for those who aren't even fans of Def Leppard, I feel there is still some respect for hysteria coming to be. One of the best-selling albums in American history, arguably the best debut from a band ever, and from a group that defined what a concert riot actually is. Appetite for Destruction in 1987 made superstars out of unique musicians, and the music is still celebrated to this day. Glam rock and hair metal kept thriving in the 80s because of Appetite for Destruction, and the 80s sleaze had new kings here. It's incredible to look back at how big Guns N' Roses became in short order. While many hair metal bands were all about presentation and attitude, Guns N' Roses had all that, and the music identity to stand out. A unique singer with wild vocals and one of the best guitarists of all time. That's how you stand out. Many people see Guns N' Roses as the last enormous name to come out of the 80s in rock, and I get that, and it's good that an album like this is tied to GNR. Welcome to the Jungle was an instant classic and probably the best intro song to an album ever, and Paradise City and Sweet Child of Mine got everyone to sing along. This was a great example of what hair metal could be for rock. Regardless of the chaotic and at times awful events after Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses made permanent fans by the millions because of this album. Even if Axel and company can't remember most of the 80s, the music still remains as a crowning accomplishment. Ending with 1984, partly because I think this is Van Halen's best album along with the debut, partly because it was David Lee Roth's last album with Van Halen for decades, and partly because I wanted to see the older generation in rage when I referred to Van Halen in the hair metal and glam category. Call Van Halen whatever you want, but Van Halen ruled in 1984 made the 80s sound like a party. Van Halen already had all the star power and fans they could imagine, and then came 1984 and the group became legendary. This was the album that made people forget about George Orwell's novel for a brief moment because because too many kids in high school were air guitaring and writing the Van Halen logo on the back of their notebooks. Jump was the song that proved Eddie wanted to expand as a musician. Panama on Hot for Teacher proved how DLR was a megastar and showman. It demonstrated everything about Van Halen and what they were capable of and why the group was so much better than their peers. I get there's an argument for Sammy Hagar and what came after, but 1984 somehow combined the elements of hair metal and glam, threw an arena rock, and made sure the world knew the name Van Halen was not just another group. There would never be another 1984, and I also don't think there will be another Eddie. R.I.P. to one of the best. And that was a look at 10 great hair metal albums from the 80s. What was your favorite album from that era? Leave a comment and let everyone know. Thanks again to Audible for sponsoring this video, and a reminder you can get a free download of The Dirt, read by the members of Motley Crue, by using the link in the video description for a free trial of Audible. It's worth it just to hear how wild Motley Crue truly was back in the day. Big thanks to my patrons, and special thanks to Chris Dome and Adam Noble. You can have a say in upcoming videos, get weekly new music playlists, and see videos early by joining Rocked on Patreon, and through the YouTube memberships. Click on the join button below or on the link in the video description for more info on how to help the channel. Please subscribe and ring the bell to get notified on upcoming videos and you can keep up to date with Rocked on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. All the jokes I made about the 80s being gross, don't take it too personal. Every decade is gross. Everyone is gross. At least that's something we can all agree on.